Okay, my friends, we we'll start again. Do we have any questions from last time? By the way, this is the, the panel I have for today. Uh, I will finish up on the forecasting part, chapter 2 of the Nomios textbook as we started out uh, last week. And then we will move into chapter 3, which is uh, related to aggregate production planning. So we will move from forecasting into more or less classical optimization problems. We will talk a little bit about production planning, what kind of costs is uh, typical when we do that. Uh, we will talk about various types of production plans, which are kind of made manually, and finally we kind of look into these matters in an in a, in a optimization perspective, formulate the linear program, how to solve this aggregate production planning problem, and then we will, after that, introduce some software which you can use to, to, to solve linear programs and other types of programs. Uh, this concept of programming may be misleading because you may get the feeling that we will program computers, which we will not. So this, this program concept in linear or nonlinear or discrete or whatever programming is related to to discrete optimization actually. So you can kind of equate programming techniques in this fashion with discrete optimization. We will return to what it's about. But we will start uh, finishing up on our forecasting techniques and last time we discussed uh, regression analysis which is a uh, important tool, not only in forecasting, but in many sites of research, as we discussed briefly. Um, uh, and we refer to that as a kind of causal method. Causality is finding uh, relations between stuff, and basically we're interested in kind of a one-way implication, so something leads to something. So we discussed that uh, cigarette smoking may lead to lung cancer. Okay, that is a kind of typical concept. It's typically not the other way around, is it? That lung cancer leads to cigarette smoking. That's not how it is. So, so that is a kind of logical causality, but there are other cases which are far more obvious than this. But we will uh, not speak more about that topic today. Um, we also briefly started discussing time series methods and the idea then is to kind of, in principle, to, to kind of look at some kind of regression techniques related to a situation where you regress a variable by itself in previous time periods. So you kind of have a time dispersed set of observations and we try to kind of identify patterns related to these historical data. Time series methods is about. And we, we briefly discussed two of those. We discussed uh, the so called moving average technique, where you simply just decide on how many previous periods to compute a simple average. That is moving average. So, from a user point of view, you kind of only decide whether to use one or two or three or four or five orders or periods previously to compute your average, and you use this average as the forecast for tomorrow. That's basically how it works. Uh, we continued uh, briefly discussing exponential smoothing, which is the same kind of technique, basically. If you remember from last time, we, uh, we looked at uh, how we could express, uh, perhaps do a slight repetition here. Uh, we started out by, uh, by defining an exponential smoothing technique as follows. Exponential smoothing. And then we just presented the formula and it looked like this. Ft equals some kind of constant alpha, which is the user input here. We kind of decide on this value and this alpha should be within these boundaries between 0 and 1. And we multiply that with dt minus 1, and dt here is kind of always observed value, so this is a kind of observation from this period, or the last period, or, or the month, while this ft denotes the forecast. So the forecast is constructed by 
taking some constant multiplying with a previous observed demand value and we kind of use the same constant but one minus alpha and multiply it with the previous forecast. So we kind of construct our new forecast by using a little bit of the last observation and a little bit of the last forecast. And this little bit is kind of defined by the value we put on this alpha. If we put this alpha very close to zero, then we use very little of the previous observed value and kind of rely on our previous forecast. If we put alpha close to one, then it's the opposite situation. In that case, this term vanishes because one minus one is equal to zero. And then we put all weight on this, uh, this uh, previous observed demand. So a big alpha, we kind of, it's often referred to as being very adaptive. We kind of adapt very easily to what happens. So if we get suddenly a very high demand, then we forecast a high demand for the next period with a high alpha, obviously. While this other extreme kind of puts emphasis in a more kind of stable situation. And you, you kind of don't change your forecast due to some maybe silly change in, in, in demand in, in a certain period. We showed last time that by writing this equation differently, we can kind of substitute set t equal to t minus 1 in this equation. In that case, we get f t minus 1 equal to alpha times d t minus 2 plus 1 minus alpha times f t minus 2, don't we? By just changing the subscript here accordingly, writing the same one at a different point in time. In that case, as you probably can see, <coughs> We get an expression for f t minus 1, which we can substitute for f t minus 1 in the first equation. And if we do that in this case, we get f t equal to alpha times d t minus 1 plus 1 minus alpha. And then, of course, we enter this expression instead of this one, producing alpha times d t minus 2 plus 1 minus alpha times f t minus 2. Of course, we can multiply this in here, and in, that, in the case we do that, we get alpha times dt minus 1 plus 1 minus alpha times this remaining alpha times the dt minus 2 observed value plus 1 minus alpha times f t minus 2. And you see, we start something here. We can, of course, continue doing this for step, several steps, if you like by putting in t equal to t minus 2, t equal to t minus 3, and so on. And we kind of argued last time that if we continue doing this, it turns out that we get a whole pile of these terms here. So we kind of make up our basic forecasts by using different weights on different previous observed value, actually the whole set of historical values in the end. And it turns out that this factors we multiply, they have this pattern. They, we can kind of write this, if we do this like uh, something like this, like a certain forecast can be constructed by summing up from a certain i from 0 to infinity of uh, alpha times 1 minus alpha to the power of i times dt minus i minus 1. You might wonder what happened to this f part. Of course, there, is all, there will always be an f left here when we continue doing this. And this uh, f, the, the remaining f here, remaining f, at some point, t minus something in, in, the, in the distant uh, past, is multiplied with, with, uh, with uh, a factor which is 1 minus 1 alpha 2 some very high power here. So the idea then is that if we kind of do this experiment or argument, this high power will kind of cancel this factor because one minus alpha is less than zero, so it's some zero point something, and when we kind of raise that to a very high power, it kind of vanishes to nothing. So we kind of end up with these as a logical uh, way of, of understanding this model. So what it basically means then is that we weigh the risk or we smooth our observations with this factor here which kind of 
change this as we move on. And if uh, i equals zero here, we start with alpha. That's the first weighting factor, smoothing factor. Then it's alpha times one minus alpha. It's alpha times one minus alpha squared. And it moves on like this. And this alpha here has a certain value we, we decide. Okay, so we put it, for instance, like if we put it to, 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 to one, then it's, uh, yeah, that's too special. We can't do that, can we? If we put it to one, then we get zero on the rest. So if we put it to 0 0.9, Okay, so we point nine, and we have this first factor which we multiply with our most previous demand figure. And then as we move on we get what do we get then? 0 0.9 times 0 0.9 that's 0 0.81. So the next one will be 0 0.81 here, which we weigh the second most previous observation. And if it gets this kind of pattern down here, this formula here is is often referred to as a discrete exponential function. So it's kind of a uh, decreasing pattern like this. So what it actually means then, if you want to look at it like this, like this is that uh, we use all our observations, but we use the most recent observation most. And then we use the second most, a little bit less, and then as we were very distant in the past, we use almost nothing. As we also said last time, if we now compare the moving average technique with this technique, we kind of see that they, to some extent, embrace a certain space which we do not exploit in using these methods. We can think of it like this. If we use moving averages, then we take a certain average and we use a certain factor, don't we? If if I produce an average of the 10 most previous observations, I multiply each of them with 1 over 10. Okay? So then I use a fixed factor, which is the same all the time. And if this is 1 tenth, and we kind of compare it to this other method, we started out with 0 0.9. We far up here, and then we got something that worked like this. This is the exponential smoothing technique, if you like. And obviously, these are kind of two extremes. In sense. We can by changing our factors in other ways, we can kind of get forecasting modes which are in here or up here or in here or down here. Okay? We kind of don't exploit that area by sticking to these two standard techniques. This is kind of obvious. Uh, of course, we could do that. So if you kind of look at something like this, and let's say, use some special Greek terms here. 5, 1 times dt minus 1 plus 5, 2 times dt minus 3 and moving on as long as we like and then possibly using something like this dt plus 1 times dt minus 1 and so on and so on then we kind of make a general linear time series model which is not restricted to having the same value on these ones as we have here, or having an expo exponential pattern on these ones as we have here. This kind of model, we kind of produce time series models in the whole area here, if you like. These models have a name, they are called A, R, I, M, A, or Arima models. And it's a whole kind of science on these matters. Actually, I wrote my master thesis on this subject. Unfortunately, I never done anything of it after. So that should perhaps tell you that the practical importance of this kind of extended, more advanced method maybe is not that big. Even in the textbook, there is some discussion on these methods. You can, of course, read it yourself, but I do not intend to, to spend time on discussing them. They are different in the sense that what you do here typically is to kind of use an estimation technique, as we call it. Remember when we discuss linear regression, then we use an estimation technique. Then we look, let our model be constructed by the data. The data itself produced our model. This is not typical when we use moving averages. In that case, we just make a decision. Okay? So we don't have a kind of automatic way of fitting data to the model. That can, of course, be done in this. Uh, in, in the same manner here as we can do in, did in the regression analysis 
And that is kind of what's underlying here. You need certain computer programs to produce certain indicators on what to do. How many terms to pick here? Should you use only one or two or three or so? How many terms to pick here? You use different methods to fix this. So, so there is a kind of a, a whole literature on this subject which you, we, we definitely do not have time to, to run into. So if you're interested, uh, there is a little bit of it in the textbook, but there are of course more in other textbooks and papers if this is something that triggers your interest. But as I said, it's uh, uh, to, I would say, to a limited extent used in practice. And the reason is perhaps that the gain you get by producing better forecasts is limited compared to the actual cost of using these methods. Because you have to have a computer kind of systems around it, you have to know the methods, you have to have software, and it takes time and all that kind of stuff. Of course, if you if you have a vast number of products that needs demand forecasts, it could be that this gain is actually too small to kind of weigh up for the, the extra administrative cost involved in actually handling it. Because you have to re-estimate the models every period and so on. So there's a lot of work involved in handling this in practice. However, I thought we should say a few words about how to deal with seasonal forecasts. We discussed last time what we mean by a season, a kind of repeating situation in data, and this is something we very often see. And we discussed that we could see seasonal aspects kind of in a fairly long run re related to weather. There are certain products sold in wintertime, others in summertime. There are certain products sold when there's sun, other products sold when there's rain, and so on. And there are kind of holiday types of seasons. We sell certain products in Easter, Christmas, and that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and this is this is very typical. It's uh, for most modern electronic products you sell most at Christmas time due to all the Christmas presents, of course. You give your son an iPad or an iPhone or whatever. Of course, that has impacts on the same. Uh, so uh, a lot of products are related to how the financial system, so to speak, works. So if there are certain people who get salary at certain points in time, then you see. Larger sales, of course, in that period. So, so this is kind of obvious. So, so we need some kind of tools to handle these seasonal mechanisms and uh, to kind of end up our discussion on forecasting in logistics. I thought we should say a few words about this. So that is uh, basically where we start today, even though it was kind of a long uh, introduction. Maybe we should just look at an example of how we actually do exponential smooth smoothing. It's uh, basically straightforward. So, let's look at the next one. Oh, exponential smoothing first. Okay, then we need some uh, observed demand values too. So let's just use these ones. Uh, first one is 200, second is 250. There is one seventy-five. So these are our observations. If this is t, then we have t to one, two, three, four, sorry, four, and that should be one eighty-six. Five is two twenty-five. So two numbers here: six two eighty-five, seven three o five, and eight one nine. You see. If you look at this number, it's not very obvious to see any pattern. You see, they kind of jump up and down in some kind of random fashion. So they may they may might look like demand figures in, in reality. Now, to do an explanation small thing, the idea is to try to find a forecast for for, for time nine in any sense. Okay, but of course we can do back forecasting as we call it, so we can kind of produce forecasts on numbers we already have observed either to try to improve it by changing our model or to see how it works basically. But in order to kind of start this process we need to, to, to get started, don't we? Our, our formula looks like this. Ft equals alpha times dt minus 1 plus 1 times alpha times ft minus 1. And if you want to find a forecast for period 1, we run into problems, don't we? Because in that case, it would be d0 here, and d0 isn't existent. We don't have that, do we? And we do neither not have this one. So 
So to start it, to find a forecast, to find a number to put under here as a forecast, we need to kind of do a trick. You know? What you typically do then is just to, to use the number you have already as your forecast. So F1 is, if you like, per definition, first observation. In this case, it was 200. Now we can start computing. Okay, so we put um, here. This is dt. This is dt. We found the first one by just making a guess. Of course, we can put in any number we like here. Basically, if you have some old forecasts running from previous history, we can use those. Okay. The idea is just to put a number here to, to get it started. Now to move on, we need to put a value on this alpha, don't we? Because we need to compute this problem. So we need to set the value. So let's make a decision. Let's say that alpha equals 0 0.1 here in this case. So, so this is not a very adaptive model. Okay? We kind of put a small weight on what really happens previously. We put more weight on 0 0.9 in this case on our previous forecast. So we should perhaps expect a number not so far from 200, do you agree? Because that is our previous forecast. But now we have what we need, don't we? Now we can compute F2 simply by putting in 0.1 times the previous observation, which is now 200, plus 0 0.9 times 200. And of course, as you maybe already have guessed, you end up with the same number. Because you can always use the same number, you can always put that out as a factor, and 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1 produces 1. So as long as we have this mechanism of using alpha and 1 minus alpha, we can always start up with, that, with the same number than for, for the second forecast. So this is 200, we get 200 here. Of course, now things will start changing because now 200 has changed to the previous observation 250. So now we will kind of get it changing. So, okay. We can see that in F3, which can, of course, again be computed straight straightforwardly by the formula by taking 0 0.1 times the now previous observation, which is 250. This one over here, so that is the, the observation from previous period and then we use the 0 0.9 and multiply with the previous forecast which is 200 so now you see me and we get the change this turns out to be 205 okay so it doesn't change very much kind of as expected due to the high weight of the previous observation as compared to the low weight of the previous forecast and of course it moves on like this doesn't it we can just keep on computing until we kind of reach the point that interests us here, which is the kind of forecast for the next period. I didn't do that, you can do it yourself if you like. You kind of construct these forecasts. I think there's a full range of numbers in the textbook. Okay. So, any questions? Of course, the problem here is to kind of find this one, isn't it? How should we do that? And I said you can either do it kind of non-scientifically by saying I, I believe mostly that uh, my basic forecast is good. In that case, I would use a low one. Okay. On the other hand, if I believe that there's a lot of changes going on, perhaps then I should stick to a larger alpha. In that case, I would kind of pick up on what's happening. Of course, if things go like this, then I run into problems, don't I? If I use a high alpha, but in that case, I will kind of, in these points, predict a high one, in these points, predict a low one. So I will kind of miss systematically. But if something goes something like this, and then it moves up to another level, and then it's, in that case, you can kind of capture what's happening by using this one. But if you have this kind of pattern, then basically you have seasonality. And then in that case, we should use a different way of doing it. So it's very important when you do practical forecasting to always check for seasonality first and try to do something with that and then kind of see what remains. In that case, you can probably use this method on what's remaining and kind of errors you get out after you come along a seasonal method. But that's not so easy to see unless we do the seasonal method first. Uh, the textbook, of course, starts 
before they do seasonal methods to discuss how to handle trend. But we have already discussed how to handle trend because we have learned regression analysis, and that is the tool used to kind of look for trends. So if there is a certain trend in the material, we just use standard linear regression to kind of estimate these trends, to find a straight line or a curved line or whatever is sensible. Uh, and then we can kind of take the, the, the remaining, the, the errors, and use those to, to look at other patterns. Just need to wash my fingers a little bit. Okay, seasonality. Something I haven't said, which of course is kind of obvious, is that when you, if you want to do forecasting, either as a student or in the real world, the first thing you always do is to plot your data to see kind of what it looks like. And, that is very and the seasonal pattern it looks something like this. We kind of have repeating patterns which comes back. And of course, the best thing is to have a logical explanation on them. You know, okay, if we sell computer games, you sell most of Christmas. And you have a kind of maybe randomly rapiding sale, which increases a little bit close to the next uh, school vacation, because you know young guys or girls, they, when they have free spare, uh, free time, they play more computer games. Maybe also sell more computer games. So you, you'll expect a kind of bump at Easter time and a very high bump at Christmas time. So, so these kind of patterns are kind of logical. In that case, yeah, you have a reason for it, and that, that's always good. But if you don't have reasons, then of course you can also do the same, use the same technique. This is kind of straightforward. So what we do in the simplest case to handle seasonality is to define seasonal factors. Let's call these seasonal factors, seasonal factors CI. And the idea is to compute them, compute, computed as number uh, which kind of decides if the observed value Value, which in our case is VT, is about or under the average. So the assumption here basically is that we have what we discussed in the first talk about forecasting, a stationary time series. So a stationary time series is kind of a containing a given average, okay? So any kind of change from that is random in the seasonal case. So now we think that we have a seasonal underlying, no, sorry, a stationary underlying time series, but we also have some kind of seasonality on top of that. So if you are able to remove the seasonality, then you are kind of remaining with this average, which kind of varies completely random uh, on our observation. So that is kind of the setting here. And so what we would like to do then is to try to, to construct some numbers which kind of either are a little bit higher than 1, which we can multiply with average to get the value, or a little bit lower than 1. So if you have a kind of seasonal pattern now, you can think about this in this way, that we, we, we would like to construct numbers which we multiply with our average to produce this seasonal pattern. And that's kind of obvious what we can do, isn't it? Let me reveal the secret for you. Let's go forward. If the underlying is an average, of course, then we can compute the average first, can't we? So the first thing to do is compute 
and reach. And the data. And then we can do the second, divide all equations. with this average, okay? So if you, if you have one observation which is exactly on the average, then we get the value of one, okay? Because if you divide the observation, uh, we can write this up, can't we? What we do here is that we compute this one, one over n, is the sum from i equals one to n, or so di, this is computing the average, and doing this operation is straightforward. We take DE, we can give a name on this average, D bar. If you take a given observation and divide it by the average, then we get what we refer to as these seasonal factors. So they have this ability, don't they? If an observation is exactly equal to the average, then there is D bar over D bar, which is 1. If it's slightly below, a little bit smaller, then we get a little bit smaller number up here than this one, which we produce a result which is somewhat under 1.0, 0.9 or something. Okay. The other way around, if uh, our observation is a bit larger than the average, then we get a little bit, little bit bigger number on top of the fraction as compared to under the fraction, and we get the value of 1 point something. Okay? This kind of defines our observation up and down related to the average. Okay, it's perhaps easier to see this, I think, if we look at an example. So let's do that. Uh, there is an example in the textbook. I kind of put it into Excel to both demonstrate the method, but also kind of lead you in the Excel direction a little bit. Probably need to use Excel a lot if you want to produce forecasts. So let's uh, look at the document part on front of here and go to added material. Then if you see at the bottom here, there is this flat in mobile, which was an example we looked at last time, which we put in. But here's a new one, seasonal factors, example two, six in the textbook. So let's open this Excel file and see what it contains. Okay, it came up nicely, that's good. Uh, let me just now do it like this, okay? So we kind of start by looking at the input here. Now, well, if I'm able to blow this up a little bit, can you see these numbers or is it a bit too small? Okay. Is this easier? Yes, a little bit? Okay. Uh, it should be possible to... I have, I'm, I'm used to Mac, and in the Mac there is uh, just something where you can kind of blow it up. 100% and 150 and so on. Yeah. Do you know where to find this here? Page layout. Okay. You probably see it, okay? Now, here, on the not bold face part here, you see this is bold face, this is not. This, this is a kind of a set of observations, okay? So here we have some numbers. On Monday in the week, first week, Tuesday in the first week, and so on. So we have weekly observations here, written like this. And if you look at the numbers, you probably see the seasonal pattern, don't you? You see that the biggest numbers are generally on the Fridays. And you have a relatively high value on Monday, but then it goes down on Tuesday, a little bit up and a little bit up again. So we can kind of draw these patterns directly on there. Okay, we start up a little high go a little down, go a little up, a little bit more up, and kind of lock up, and then it repeats itself. So this pattern, pattern kind of is what we roughly draw, okay, something like this. This is a typical seasonal, seasonal pattern. And of course, if you like, we can always construct a figure in Excel straightforwardly from these numbers. Uh, if you go at the bottom here, I've done that. Okay, here you can see them, the actual numbers. Okay. This is what this is if you plot it in, in a graph directly. Now, in order to kind of do our task here, we need to produce the average, and I've done it uh, very simple here. I just added together all numbers in each column here, divided. No, I haven't made any division yet. Okay. 
just reduced to sum here. And if you look at uh, the content of this cell, you'll probably see that it contains this formula. Equals sum from C2 to C6. C2 is here, C6 is there. So I just add together these numbers. I do the same here, same here, here. So I get weekly sums at the bottom here. And then, of course, I can add all these together to produce a sum here, but then I have to divide it by all the numbers, or the actual number of numbers in the table, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, which is 20. So here it should say something like equal sum of these numbers divided by 20. That seems reasonable, doesn't it? Probably that's what it says. That's exactly what it says, isn't it? I sum C7, which is this value, up to F7, which is that value, and divide by 20 to produce the average. And the average is 16.695. And then to produce these system factors, the idea is to take each of the original observations and just divide by these numbers. That is done if we move to the right here. And you see, I kind of use bold face to indicate that now I've done something. So the original data is kind of not bold face, but everything else is kind of indicating that now I've done some operations here. Of course, each number here now is, is, is easily constructed by just taking the value from the left hand side and divide by this, and you see, you remember this? To use this dollar sign to kind of keep the number. The idea then is in Excel, if I want to produce all these numbers, I just produce the first one and then just copy everything. So then, on the top here, and then maybe we should do that too. On the top here, I just pick a certain number, for instance, the first one here, and divide it by this number here, which is fixed, and then I copy everything, and then I get all the season limits straight for in just one operation. Okay. I'll go back in a bit, so I don't confuse you too much. Okay. Now I want to put your uh, focus on the final column here, average season factor. Okay, what I'm wanting to do now is to produce forecasts for the next Monday, the next Tuesday, the next Wednesday, the next Thursday, and the next Friday. Okay, that's what's coming. In order to do that, I cannot use all these seasonal factors, can I? Because I have different seasonal factors from different weeks. Of course, now I can start really thinking, okay, I may, maybe I should put more weight on the last Monday factor, I observed this one in week 4, then on the first one. So you can kind of build new models here, for instance using exponential smoothing on these ones. It's obviously a possibility. But the normal way of doing it is as simple as possible. Just add all these four together and produce the average. Then I have a kind of single average season factor which I can produce, which I can use to produce my actual forecast. I need to kind of put these numbers together to produce a single factor which points to the next model. And, and of course, I can do that in many ways, but uh, the easiest way is just to average these four numbers to produce this one, average these four numbers to produce this one, keeping all like that. And you see, you get kind of what you expect here. You get a factor slightly above one in the first period, then something smaller goes down, then something smaller goes down again, actually a little bit up, then a little bit up and up to the biggest one. Fridays, which is 1.4. Okay, this is kind of our aim, aimed output. This is what we'd like to produce, because now we can produce forecast for the next week. And that is straightforward to do now, isn't it? Because we have computed our average, it's here, 16 point, oh, 0.695, so it's really easy to just use that average multiplied with these factors to produce the forecast for the next week. Uh, so the actual calculation, so straightforward. We just uh, produce the forecast for next Monday. 
if I do it like this. By taking the average of 16.695 and multiply that with the corresponding system factor, the system factor for Monday, which is 1.00. 797. That produces uh, a number which you don't see here. Okay, we just move on. We'll pass for next Tuesday. Again, we assume the underlying fixed average. And now we plug that with the second season factor, which is 0 0.7038. Four. Oh, four. Seven, three, eight, oh, four. Which also is something. And we keep on doing this until we've done it for all days. So, this method is straightforward. Even though there is some kind of dead ends here, we could do it a bit more complex if you like, but uh, uh, it turns out in most practical cases to work relatively good. And here you see the red uh, bars where I actually produced uh, the forecast. You see that the forecast in the first period is fairly close to the average, a little bit higher due to these numbers here, 16.725, and you end up with 23.45 for the Friday forecast. Well, finally, what we'd like to do perhaps is to produce a graph which uh, shows the original observations and your forecast. I missed one here, haven't I? Actually, five days here, but there's one, two, three, four. It should be an observation there which I haven't put in. Okay. Sorry about that. And you see the blue ones here. Uh, maybe this is the first. Yeah, this, yeah. See the blue ones here? Are the actual observations? I'm just kind of added the, the forecasts uh, in the end. Let me see all my numbers here. One, two, three, four, five. So this is actually a forecast, I think. Isn't it? 16? Yes, sorry, this is the first one, this one. So then, uh, how did I fix that? Let's see. Uh, what I'm intending to do now is to produce a red line down here, okay? To indicate that I actually have my file forecast, so I did a slight error in my, in my preparations here. So let's see if I'm able to fix it. You know how to do this? Change. Maybe here. Marker fill, solid fill. Let's use red then. Eh? Well, no. Ah, then I got a red point, and then I need a red line here. And I have to pick the point. Uh, formate uh, line color. That seems sensible. Solid line. I pick red again. Oh, <laughs> that was wrong. What can I do then? Yeah, just hit control set. Then. So maybe I should uh, have to pick this point then to get the red line up. Mm -hmm. That seems reasonable. Let's try that. Line color, solid line, red seems to be the case here. Maybe I need to do this once more. Close. Ah, there we are. Okay, no, it's correct. Let me just save it. Is that possible? Do you think? Yeah. It is downloaded from uh, front end. Can I save it and then get it? That's true. Let me try. Okay, save. To save a copy, click OK, then give the workbook a new. Ah. We need to. Uh, yeah, yeah. It wants to save it as, okay, because yeah. it cannot put it into the internet by itself. So let's see if we can find it. So let me put it. Uh, save. Then it's uh, here. Yes. yes. Then I can just upload that, can I? Yeah. Maybe I should change the name to remo remove this copy, not to make uh, students too confused. Like this. And I have to go auto Excel then. Now this is, I think I do it to three and the same. Same as I used to do. Should be necessary. We go off and see what's happening. Okay. Try again. Yeah, then it works. 
Then we go into front head and then we remove this one. By delete that's on here. Okay. And then we have to upload the fixed version, single file. And we will browse and we will desktop. This Try and see if it's correct. It seems good, okay? I'm happy. Mm -hmm. So we fixed the error. Okay, do you understand this? This is easy, isn't it? Yes. This is necessary for your first exercise. Now I'm going to take a break and then I'll discuss the next exercise a little bit before we move on, okay? okay. So let's see. Take 15.